Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be back at the wine experience. I've been waiting a few minutes. I think we've been waiting for a few years now, so that little pause uh, allowed me to gather my thoughts. Um, but I particularly want to congratulate you um, and uh, uh, Tom and uh, James, the team, Marvin, who's watching us, I believe, at home, hello, uh, for 40 years of bringing pleasure to the wine community. For us as producers, but first and foremost, as Chuck said, we're amateurs. And uh, we come together here to share an extraordinary moment. There is a generosity in this room. There's a generosity in this community. And that permeates um, everything that uh, the wine experience has been doing here for decades. Um, not only just through the raising $30 million over the years for uh, different efforts within the wine community, thanks to your visit, thanks to your participation. Tom had asked me uh, to present a wine, but also to present a story. Um, we spent uh, literally days, if not weeks, uh, together uh, talking about Aubryon and Domaine Clarence Dillon. Um, over COVID, I guess you could say that Tom was my therapist, and a very good one at that. We were able to talk about the story uh, of the wines as they progressed over the millennia. And yes, uh, the first vines were planted in our soils about 2,000 years ago. But my story, our family story, uh, started more recently. And Chuck obviously talked about Napa and the, the wines of uh, California. It could have started there. I know that Clarence Dillon, who is on, here on the left, um, this is about 1935, actually 37 to be exact, um, was also looking at acquiring Beaulieu Vineyards at that time. I actually have the whole file of the Beaulieu, Beaulieu Vineyards a uh, state dating back then. Obviously, it was just post-prohibition. Um, and he had started a, uh, a bank, Dylan Reed, um, but he had offices in Paris, and he had, uh, was descended from uh, his mother. Uh, his mother's side was a French-Swedish family. Uh, her name was Bertha Steinbock. I wanted to serve the wine of 2003. As you said, Tom, um, I'm not an enologist. Uh, and I have a very good team of enologists that I've been working with uh, for decades. Uh, they cannot be with us today. I surfed in here into the country thanks to uh, one document. It's called a marriage certificate. So I'm lucky enough to be married to an American wife. And uh, she was quite surprised that I was allowed in the country without her, but I was. I just had to show this piece of paper that got me in. And you can see a lot of the wine producers that were here today are also married to Americans. It's amazing how many, how many of us are. So uh, you have this uh, the link between the two countries and, and also with Italy and Spain and such. But yes, I wanted to talk about the hot vintages. And uh, Chuck was talking about um, the, dry, uh, the, the, the dry farming. Uh, that is the law still with us in, 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 in Bordeaux. We're not allowed to irrigate. And, um, I am not a denier of global warming. Global warming is impacting our vines uh, massively. We have to take this into consideration as we plan for the future and as we decide how we plant, what we plant, how we tend the vines. Uh, all of that is going to be taken into consideration. But one, one of the things that I wanted to say by serving this 2003 vintage um, is that we can make extraordinarily elegant um, uh, wines that are very much in the image of the wines of Aubryon. And in fact, some of the most extraordinary wines uh, that we've made over the history of Chateau Aubryon have been in exactly vintages that are particularly dry um, and hot. So obviously 1945 was more important to us than just the wine because it was the, the victory year. Well, we had been a, uh, uh, set up as a hospital, that house there by my great-grandfather um, during the war for the French, and then it was uh, um, taken over, obviously, during the occupation. Um, but, that, but that house was, uh, was, was, was used you know, in the early years as a hospital. Um, this is about 1945. This is our future winemaker, Jean-Bernard Delmas, standing in the vines as a young boy, probably just post-war. Um, and I think actually this was taken by an American photographer uh, who was visiting, um, and I can't remember his name. But this uh, Delmas family uh, arrived at Aubryon in 1923, and now we're working with the third generation of the family. 
This is another very hot vintage, the 47. Uh, hottest summer in 50 years. Uh, so, you know, like the uh, uh, 2003 or so, very limited rainfall. 1955, another very uh, hot vintage. Um, hotter than the 53 that we enjoyed together, Tom. Uh, Tom and I uh, compared our, our birth vintages together. Sorry, am I giving away state secrets, Tom? Um, he's extraordinarily well preserved, so you have no idea uh, of, of that. But so was the wine. The wine was absolutely amazing. And uh, so the 68, Actually, I know the 68s are more well-known in, in, in California, and ironically, I've enjoyed a BV uh, 68 over the years. But I think our 68 is just as good. It's, it's overlooked, and it has a depth and a surprising uh, amount of fruit in, in the wine. This is Clarence and Anne in, in front of Chateau Aubriand around that same period. Uh, 1955 was also the first time that my mother uh, came to the estate, and we organized a, uh, a ball at the estate to celebrate uh, with all of the Bordelais. 1959, another extraordinarily hot vintage um, that produced one of the most um, famous wines of, of Aubriand. As it says, the harvest time was very hot and the wine's extremely concentrated. So interestingly enough, even with the 2003, as I come back to this, We don't necessarily um, have uh, the same concentration, even as you might have um, in the 55, where there's a more, oh, sorry, the 59, where there's more depth of fruit and a greater length to it. So this is all to do with the, 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 the winemaking uh, practices, and also, of course, when you pick. And by the way, because my very sad enologist colleagues who wanted to be here and cannot be here. Um, and are represented by, badly by me, um, are not here. I also served a vintage that we had shown before with the wine experience here, and you can find Jean-Philippe Delmas uh, talking about the wine and um, how he made the 2003 and how this happened to be the handover year between him and his father. So this is uh, a story not only about wines made in hot vintages, but also about transmission from generations. In the case of Jean-Philippe, the third generation of a winemaking family. Um, in the case of the uh, Dillon family, I'm the fifth generation, fourth generation, but fifth generation if you count Bertha Dillon. And now we have up to seven generations of our family have been associated with, with the estate. There is the 61 vintage. And I remember uh, when both Jean Delmas retired and my stepfather, Philippe de Mouchy, in 2003, which is this vintage, uh, we had a little celebration uh, for both of them down at Aubriand. And the first night we served the 61, um, including the 1924 also, which was Georges Delmas's first uh, year. And then we served uh, also the 61, which was Jean's first year, um, among others. Uh, a little wine called the 89, which wasn't all bad either. Um, we had no 82 to serve because we served it to all of you when you were here for my mother's uh, presentation of the Grand Award. So, live and learn, we'll never do that again. Uh, no. The 82 vintage, as I said, you've drained it here, sitting in this very hotel. Um, and uh, we had a very nice time doing it. Another one of these very hot vintages, uh, like, um, like the 2003, I would say also slightly deeper fruit, but the fact is that we can, even with these extremes, keep this freshness in, the, in these wines. And I think you'll see that whether it's the 15s, the 16s, the 19s, the 20s, um, you're going to still see you know, this freshness that you have in the 2000 that's a, truly the extreme vintage. I better have another sip. So nothing like that in the morning. So the 89 we already spoke about. This is about the time that uh, I became more actively involved in the early 90s um, in, in the business. As uh, uh, Tom very aptly said, and, and uh, you will may be able to read. I haven't read the article yet. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, 
any of the good stuff is true, by the way, and, and ignore the other stuff. He must have made a mistake. Uh, but this is my sister Charlotte, my mother and me, sitting at the, in the living room at Aubryon about the time when I'm going to make a switch, a transition from my beginning of my writing career to, to, uh, to this and my backpacking around the world trying to figure out what was going, I was going to be doing with my life. And around this time, um, there had been indication that my family were, were interested in me being involved with, with a company, but there had not been a clear expression of that. So eventually, um, in about 93, 94, um, I, I spoke to my grandfather and I said, you know, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing writing um, as, as, as I'm collaborating with my wife. Um, writing screenplays, but if you would like me now uh, to be more active in the business, I have to make a choice, go one way or, or the other. And I imagined that I could always come back uh, to screenwriting or writing or sculpture, which was one of my other passions uh, as a young artist. Um, and I decided to, uh, to, to take the plunge at, at his request. Um, I was actually here in New York with him when we had that conversation at our office um, not far from here. Um, and he said, yes, I would like to have your help. And so I ended up getting a small office in, in London and, and, and getting started officially in the world of wine. 2015 vintage, another very hot vintage. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, we presented some of these wines <coughs> in the past here. They, uh, they retain a little bit more fruit than the 2003, as do the 16s, um, but still this extraordinary freshness. So this is Aubryon today, and uh, uh, it's seen a facelift. We have much more to do. We are inspired by 2,000 years of history. We are adapting to uh, the climate as things advance, and we're trying to continue to make uh, extraordinary wines that we can share with all of you. Um, Tom, you want to retire, but you're never going to retire from the uh, community of wine. Uh, as you say, this is a place of generosity. Once you're part of the family, once you're part of the family, you're always part of the family. So I look forward uh, to sharing uh, many more glasses, not only with uh, all of you, but also with Tom Matthews. And thank you for all of your friendship, for your interest, and also for that 1953, which I never would have opened without you.